Welcome everyone to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host Pablo, and with me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. What's going on, Brian? How much, Pablo? Busy week, some big news. Another episode of WandaVision. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in having that discussion. Because you last time you said when we had that discussion, you said six would be trying your your <laughs> your um what was it? My patience. You, yeah, your patience. This one was trying my patience a bit. Until it got towards the end. Oh, first of all, we want to send out our condolences to the King family, the Irish King family, and, and and Hank Aaron. You know, people that you grew up watching, and 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 you know, and they're you know they're gone, and and that's why I like doing this show because it, it sort of gives you that that small little escape of the harsh realities of life, you know, and it, it just provides that moment of just getting away from it all, and, and enjoying life. But um, my condolences to those and anyone who's lost anyone during this pandemic. Um, there was a recent article from the Wall Street Journal. What was the guy's name that wrote it? Um, his name. Mr. R.T. Watson wrote a very, very interesting article, very detailed article. We know more than what we we kind of knew before, but this one gave us a little bit more data, more accuracy. And and the article is called Want to be a Hollywood player COVID and streaming have changed all the rules. And it has and it's caused quite a bit of confusion for a lot of studios and for some they have been able to uh, sort of sort of figure things out and change and, uh, and, and, and be a little bit more flexible in terms of how they do things. But Warner Brothers is not one of them. And a lot was said. I'm just going to ask a few questions. You guys, I'll, I'll link the link. Uh, I'll link the, the article in the description below and you guys can check it out. But I want to ask Brian some questions based on what I read. And, and, and I want to get his take on, on, on this article. Do you believe at and being, you know, being the parent company of Warner Media, Warner Brothers, could you point the finger at them for this organization uh, that WB is experiencing right now and the relationship it has sort of disrupted between the talent and studio? Considering, you know, this is the first time, according to the article, 100 years is the first time they don't have a sole executive that is in charge of producing and distributing movies directly to the screen. Also considering, you know, you have people like Will Smith, Tom Hanks, looking, you know, looking after their interest and renegotiating their contracts. What, what do you do? You point the finger at AT and T for not being uh, involved more in this. It's, it seems like, or not thinking this through. Short answer is yes. I think there's. It's impossible to assign 100% of the blame to any one party. But I think what you would say is, and I always like the sports analogies, if you see a dysfunctional franchise, it starts with ownership yeah. 100% of the time. There's never been an instance I can think of where you've had a tremendous owner and a terrible rank and file. It, yeah. it just doesn't. So if there are problems in the middle ranks and there's problems with relationships and problems on the field, it's because somewhere at the top, yeah. there's a breakdown in process. And so I think you clear, this article to me took a lot of the things we were sort of speculating about and quite honestly, just were astonished at yeah. in terms of how things fell out once Warner Brothers moved the 2021 slate, which we were like, this is great. But in our minds, I think we, were, we assumed that everyone yeah. was on board with yeah. this move. <laughs> and this article really hammered home how untrue that was. And I know we'll talk about the big, the biggest piece of the fallout that's yeah. coming out of this, but yeah. it, it just continues to astound me when they talked about Toby Emmerich making these phone calls and then people kind of saying like, boy, he's, you know, 
it's not his fault, but he's delivering a, you know, a message that's impossible for the talent to kind of get behind. And yeah. just what a mess this was um, before and after they made an announcement of such scale. So short answer, yes, AT&T has to wear some of the responsibility for what goes on in, you know, it's subsidiary, it's subsidiary entities. Yeah, yeah. You know, according um, to Comscore, uh, last year's domestic office, domestic box office, box office revenues were just two point two twenty eight billion dollars, down from eleven point four billion in the prior year of two thousand nineteen. Do you think we are gonna go get back to those numbers? If yes, how? So I'm going to answer that. So I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to put an asterisk on it. Mm -hmm. So I think let's write off 2021. I know we still have basically May. The calendar is pretty empty until May. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let's just say, look, let's take 2021 and assume everything gets pushed to 2022. So we get a Jan 1, 2022 pressure. Yeah, I think the sheer volume of ten pole movies that need to come out because we're basically going to get two to three years worth of pictures in one year means we will get back to those kind of numbers but it'll be a little artificial because in what you're giving me is the number for a year that had you know no one competes with endgame no one competes with rise of skywalker right they they clear out for those movies and now we're going to get a year where Fast and Furious, Marvel movies, DC movies, Godzilla, yeah. they're all gonna pile into the same area. So you're gonna get this abnormally big box office, I think, for like one year. But I, as far as is that sustainable? Probably not, because the re the future years aren't gonna be as crowded. So that's kind of how I see that. Yeah. This year is gonna be very interesting. It's gonna either suggest that it can be done this way and how and however way they're doing it now or something needs to change well i mean because listen the hopes is on this vaccine rollout right but that's going pretty slow in the u.s yeah yeah so i mean it's good i think but but i think the studios have hope for that that they'll correct that and therefore they're sticking by their dates that they have out for this year yeah, let's also be straight. When I say the U.S., it's New York and California. That's really what that's eight. I think that's eighty percent of wow. the box okay. office. So if you can't get those two states normal and fully functional, okay. th th there's no there's no comparisons you can make. Okay. How bad do you think it sucked for Mr. Emmerich to have to tell people that he's made deals with? who respect him, who have known him for many years and have built great, uh, a great relationship with them to have to break the news to them. Well, I mean, the, the, my cynical response is you, that entire line of conversation could have been handled a lot differently. Of course. If you really had, you know, if you really had the rapport and the res mutual respect and the longstanding relationship, you should be able to get those individuals and their agents in a room and sort of say, look, here's what we're thinking about. Here's our situation financially. We yeah. need to get some of these projects to the audience. Yeah. We understand, you know, Will Smith, Tom Hanks, Gal Gadot, they all under even Chris Nolan, they all understand the world's not normal right now. Yeah. So, the, but the worst thing you can do is, you know, do it the way detonate the bomb. <laughs> and then come and say, hey, can I help clean up the house that I just destroyed? That's not really what you want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it just feels like everything here was a little, was backwards. And so a lot of what you're seeing now is a function of they didn't solicit the right feedback before they made the move to say like, look, there's ways to work around this one deal, this one situation, and then going forward, we can get it back. They, it, it, reading the article, it felt even more self-inflicted to me than I perceived it to be, you know, before before the, these kind of facts came out. Yeah. Did you feel any certain way or thought anything um, regarding 
Gal Gadot getting more than Patty Jenkins for the for Wonder Woman eighty four? No, I, I didn't know it. I mean, I don't I don't know what the starters fees were, right? So it's fifteen. Well, first off, it's more than ten. We heard ten plus, right? Yeah. And we find out fifteen is a lot more than ten. Thirteen is a lot more than ten. That's, yeah. that's not that's not change. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously that's on top of the salaries they were getting. So you figure like, you know. I mean, where Gall is right now, she's going to be pulling fifteen to twenty million dollars a picture. So she basically got that for this movie. You know, only got a couple hundred thousand for the first one. So, no, yeah. I don't read too too much into that. Um, and I doubt the two of them are like looking at each other, being like, "You got two million more than I did." Like that's that's be, and I, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, for me, I just like you know, Patty Jenkins is you know, I think the reason for Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot obviously did a tremendous job as Wonder Woman. But, but maybe she. But I'm saying maybe her base salary was two million dollars higher than Gal Gadot's. So yeah. they could have gotten the same total compensation. We don't know that. So. Based on, you know, the numbers. You know, how confident do you think Warner Media is in their platform? Do you think they have a lot of confidence in being able to compete with Netflix and Disney Plus? Because um, they declined to say how many subscribers actually watched. I mean, these are numbers you can pretty much. They you know, know. They know. They know the numbers. They, yeah. didn't, they didn't say anything about it, nor did they say how many new subscribers they got. So, how confident do you think is do do you think Warner Brothers or AT and T is, is confident in HBO Max to be a, a, a competition for Disney Plus and Netflix? Mm, I think there's two ways to answer that. So, one is. Are they, is the end game here to be a standalone competitor or is the end game to be as attractive an acquisition candidate as possible? Those are both, and those are not opposing goals. Uh, I think, I think there's real value to the catalog because HBO had real IP, a lot of good television IP, Sopranos, Wire, um, even shows now that you're, you know, like whether it's like Westworld or Game of Thrones or, you know, there's real, Right. Real critical mass there. And then you take Warner Brothers as a studio had assets. Now they lost one of their biggest ones as part of this, which is a real problem, but they had, you know, franchises, they had the DC universe. So I think there's enough here for them to credibly be, at least for a while, an independent entity. Now, I don't know if there's enough for them to justify charging $10 more a month than yeah. Disney. But, or charging as much as Netflix. But I think there's enough for them to kind of go it alone for a while. And then I do think down the road, if they if they did want to partner up with one of the other streaming services, I think they would get a nice premium for their catalog. It is certainly better than like what a Paramount could throw together or even quite honestly, what a Universal could throw together right now. So, um, so I, I do think there's real value. I just, clearly something has happened, like they just, they were unable to penetrate their own customer base to get them to sign up for this. That I mean, I'm surprised. I feel like if Disney had a cable channel like that, like HBO, I feel like the penetration of their subscriber base would have been way higher than the 35, 40% or whatever that, that, that uh, HBO Max has been at. So hopefully it's just a slow start for them. But I but, mean, they, uh, did, they, they did start off by making huge mistakes and not being a, a, in partnership with Roku and other. Um, yes, that that did hurt. You know, for sure. It's, it's just like, I, I, have to, I, I have to ask the question, does AT&T really care about this part of their business? Almost, it almost seems like, you know, at any point, if this doesn't go out or, 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 or succeed the way they they should succeed based on the IP that they have, that they'll sell this off. Well, their first priority is, uh, it seems like, is to sell direct TV. That's the sinking ship they've been trying to get rid of. So they, you know, when we talk about AT&T, let's at least acknowledge there's a lot of businesses they're dealing with. There's a cellular business, but then there's a satellite TV business that may or may not have real value that they're trying to find a buyer for. Yeah. And then there's this that they're trying to grow. So that's a lot of change yeah, yeah. Um, in a relatively short span of time. So you may be right. I mean, at the end of the day, they need cash, they need profits, they need earnings. So like they may need to monetize this asset, you know, oh, and, you know, quite honestly, someone 
you know, like if you handed this off to, let's say Netflix acquired the entire entity, I think we would trust in Netflix's marketing skills to kind of build the base of, of this or the viewership of these shows a lot faster, but who knows? I mean, that's that feels a little ways off, to be quite honest. I don't think they'll just hand that off now because they've got so much new content coming. I think they would at least want to see what's the traction of that before they throw in the towel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, while studios generally split half the ticket revenues with theaters, they keep the majority of the money generated from streaming services. Yep. And that begs me to this, this, you know, you know, movie, the movie theater business. And, you know, I know we have spoken at nauseum about what theaters need to do in order to sort of get us back to the theaters and just get that experience back. Cause it can't be the same, you know, but when you talk numbers, like we, the ones I just mentioned, 11.4 billion, 2019, 2020, 2.28 billion. The difference there is eight to nine billion dollars. That's a lot. But by 2025, you know, they expect the services combined, Disney Plus, Netflix, HBO Max, to have 1.34 billion subscribers and generate a, a, a 85 billion, 85 billion dollars. And like, um, the CEO of, uh, of Vine Out of Alternative Investment, Jim Moore, um, who invests in movies, um, he said, this is, at the end of the day, this is a business. You know, money talks. When you talk those numbers, what is it that keeps you um, interested in the, in the theater aspect if they are not able to get people to come into the theaters like they used to. Uh, I mean, I just think theaters as they stand now are becoming more niche. Um, now it happens to be a niche that you and I love because it's yeah. the kind of movies that we care about. We'll continue to go to the theater, you know, post vaccine because there is a demand for that and there is a value to that um and i don't think that's going to change I, you know i guess I, if i was to draw an analogy to like the music industry where basically the revenue stream from selling albums dried up right over over 2030 or changed dramatically because of napster streaming services yeah but tour, but tours the live experience became the greater profit center Yes. But if you think about like different acts, there are incredibly talented singer songwriters whose art doesn't lend itself to a big visual spectacle, right? Like you're not going to go to giant stadium to watch one person with a guitar yeah. in two hours, yeah, yeah. but you will go watch, you know, you two, you know, over and over again, or you will go watch, you know, pick Beyonce. You, like, there are yeah. acts who who do something beyond the music that says, I need to go see them live. I don't think movies are any different, right? Like the streaming services have taken all of these genres and that used to be in the theater that are smaller budget and said, hey, you can watch them there. And you know what? The experience on your nice TV at home, is kind of the same. It's not that much different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas Avengers Endgame, Godzilla versus Kong, our TV can be as good as it wants. Our Dolby can be as good as it wants. It's not going to replicate what we can get out of that screen yeah now you could say maybe someday but not yet so i think for those movies there is a reason to go and i think people will go but if, if the theaters want more than that that's on them they have to innovate something yeah 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 i agree with you 100 percent um, and i had a really interesting so if we talk we'll get to i know we'll talk about um mr nolan in a few minutes but had really interesting grapple with this idea with tenant and I want to talk about that when we get to Nolan because it's yeah he's Mr. Theater but I actually for this particular movie I found myself really valuing that I could watch this at home okay my concern with regards to the DC IP mm -hmm. is that do you think that Walter Hamada has the same sort of control as a Kevin Feige has over at MCU. No, I mean, I don't think, and I don't think there's the same trust. I think you see that 
in the final products, the inconsistency of the results. You hear it in when Patty Jenkins talks about her experience of trying, you know, they, they wanted to cut the opening. They made me change the third act. Studios are always going to have a hand, you know, like I, you know, I hate to, so I'm going to invoke his name. People at home, don't worry about it. Harvey Weinstein. Okay. Take out the personal stuff for a second. Just his style of making movies, which had, you know, took a smaller studio and had a lot of success with Miramax over the years. Mm -hmm. He was known for having a very heavy hand in editing oversight, making filmmakers cut 10, 20 minutes out of a film. Like that was his style and it worked. It, by and large, it worked really well. Yeah. So let's not pretend that a studio can't add something to the editing process. But the problem is with, you know, when you have studios where there seems like there's so many cooks in the kitchen, that rarely seems to lead to a good outcome. There has to be an alignment and a trust mm -hmm. between the filmmaker, the producer and studio head mm -hmm. um, to really believe in a vision. Yeah. And if and it, it just has seemed with DC that it's been very inconsistent, even when they've had success, like even when there's a movie like Joker where it felt like the studio largely got out of Todd Phillips way and was rewarded handsomely for that. Gosh. They don't seem to then take that philosophy and apply it necessarily to the next movie, so. But my, but the thing is that, yeah, they have a, they're still gonna be, you know, making sure this happens or whatever, they wanna see this or they wanna see that, but they're, these are people who perhaps don't know these characters like you and I know them, you know, right. and want them to be. And so I think that approach for characters that you know nothing about really, it hurts, I guess, the experience for us knowing a little bit more than perhaps they do in terms of who these characters are, who they, what they need to do and how this needs to go down. Instead, they're making still, you know, blanketed general movie decisions that don't apply perhaps to, to this IP. So that's my concern there with, with their involvement. Um, somebody who, has been sort of, you know, delivering each time out, <laughs> saying, I'm out, just because I didn't like the way you went about it. And he has every right to take his talent elsewhere. Nolan is gone from Warner Brothers. Wait, we said, we said, did we not say the yeah. biggest risk to what was going on was they could not afford to lose <laughs> the IP that would come out of the head of somebody like Chris. And now it's happened. And, and let's like, knows this is follow suit. Who knows? There, there are other directors who listen, the way the industry is going now, going right now, the content is is needed and they're going to look for the best people to deliver that to them listen shonda i forget her, her name shonda she, rhymes yes she left abc apparently this is this is what i was told she left abc to go to netflix why because they wouldn't give her disney tickets Disney Park tickets. They didn't want to give it to her. She asked for some tickets to take her family. And they said, no, she said, I'm out. It took only that. And one, and, and Nolan, I don't, I don't blame Nolan for leaving. And yeah, we told you guys, listen, they can't afford, but they did this. And who knows? Think just thinking about it. Who knows who may follow suit, man? Who knows? This is, yeah. This yeah. was the news of the week. I mean, we got to talk about this because Christopher yeah. Nolan is, I mean, I'm biased, but for my money, the, the best filmmaker at, at his peak. I mean, I know Spielberg still works and guys like that are legends, but you know, for a guy who's like at the peak of his powers in terms yeah. of talent and originality, yeah. this is the guy. They had, this is a LeBron in 2010. So, you know, saying I'm going to South Beach. Like I, this is this is that for the movie <laughs> industry. I am like, if you're Warner Brothers, that I. I nothing is worth that i mean i you know they can say like tenet didn't do what they think it was they thought it was whatever like the guy's been phenomenally successful for 20 years for them he is as money as there is in the industry 
to have him walk is a huge black eye. And I'm also now just, I'm fascinated to see where he goes. Because he doesn't really do fit think he as a Disney. I think, I don't see it. Like, he's yeah. not really that kind of director. Yeah. Everyone says Universal. That's kind of the odds on favorite. Why Universal and not someone like Netflix? So that's my answer. Why not? Because I guarantee that the streaming services are going to bid for him 3x, 4x, 5x, whatever the major studios are. Because there's no, like, if you're Netflix or you're Prime or what, there's no premium that you would put that's too big on his talent. Like, yeah, it's not. Like, what he could do if you just turned him loose for 10, 20 years and you basically got out of his way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so now, on the flip side, Chris Nolan's ne here's why he wouldn't do it. He is the biggest proponent of the theatrical experience. And to sign with a streaming service would arguably be the biggest hypocrisy that he could commit. True. After he just left Warner saying you moved everything to streaming. True, true. So that would be the, and he doesn't need the money. We know that. Yeah. So, but let's say he does land at Universal. I mean, that's a game changer for, we talk about streaming. We talk about back to streaming versus theatrical. It's a game changer for them. I mean, they, they have Fast and Furious, they have Bourne. They had this guy and like what he's capable of, you know, that's, that's an, I mean, it's a, it's gonna be one of the most fascinating stories, I think, to see who, who gets him for the next 10, 20 years. Who's to say that Netflix, being that Disney is doing it, HBO Max has content on theaters, Disney theaters. Why wouldn't Netflix want to get into that business as well? What's stopping them from doing so? Well, this this goes back to the thing I had sort of posited, which was with the streaming streaming services, you know, could and should own theaters. I mean, it's actually Netflix does own a few theaters, actually, not like okay. huge chains, but they do. Okay. Like, what if they went to Chris Nolan and said, "We'll structure a deal with you, where." you're going to be under our umbrella. So unlimited resources, as much product as you want, your brother can come right and do whatever he wants, but we'll put all your stuff in a theater branded under us. And it'll be like the Chris Nolan theatrical experience sponsored by Netflix. Like, I don't know if he'd listen. I just, I'm curious, but I feel like he's going to have all sorts of stuff thrown at him because of his talent. Um, and having seen Tenet, I will say for a film that was very polarizing for people, it's it's I think it's excellent, um, and I, I recommend anyone check it out. I'm gonna but, check it out um, tonight, probably. But I will I will say to you, <laughs> this is what I was what point I was gonna make. It is a movie that if I saw it in the theater, I actually don't think I would have liked it quite as much. And I know that sounds weird because the scale of it is huge. So when you see some of the stuff, you'll be like, "This would have been so cool on IMAX." Yeah. But the movie is so complicated that when you get to the end of it, the ability to rewind it and replay it was actually invaluable to my enjoyment of the movie. <laughs> so I was like, I really like being able to go back and watch 10 minutes again, yeah, to yeah. understand what they did and said and say, oh, I totally missed that the first time. <laughs> so I just point that out. It was a great experience though. And to tie it back to our genre, Pattinson and John David Washington, incredible. Like Pattons, you watch it and you'll be like, I can't. Now I can't. If you if your anticipation for the Batman was already off the charts, you'll watch him in this movie and say, A, I, I'm all in on him as an action guy. He has the physicality, and B, why don't we talk about him as James Bond? Because <laughs> he definitely, basically, is that character in this movie, and, and he looks great as James Bond. He sounds great, and he yeah, as a British guy, and he can be oh. James Bond for a minute. He's a long, he's very young, right? We talk about they want Tom Hardy. I'm like, Tom Hardy's like 10, 12 years older than him. And Tom so, Hardy, from what I, you know, based on the things that I've heard, and there was an interesting, uh, I don't know if, if you've ever watched Hollywood Reporter when they sit down and talk. Yeah. yeah. Actors, um, Shia LaBeouf said something to the effect that he's a gorilla on set. He's hmm. ready when he's ready. Do they do they want that kind of uh, dynamic when doing Bond? Because you know, Bond is what the people who are creating says is Bond, right? And if what works for Tom Hardy doesn't work for them, how do they approach that situation and say, "No, you can't do it this way"? You know, I, I don't know, but yeah, 
watching this movie, I was like, he basically is a suave spy in yeah. this movie. And he looks and sounds amazing. And there's scenes where he's walking around where you're like, that is Bruce Wayne. Like he already is Bruce Wayne in this movie. You're just not seeing the bats. Just change the hair to that. <laughs> it's also the suit, you know, the way he kind of is doing, he does a little detective work in this movie. And you're kind of like, yeah, I get it. Like the DNA is there. The other thing, by the way, is I, we have to find a, a role for John David Washington in the superhero genre because his athleticism as an action star, well, he is a former college football player so that you see that he is incredibly coordinated and he just has so much charisma. Actually, one of the reasons I really like this as a Nolan movie is he, most Nolan leads are kind of, they're kind of down, dramatic, like sadder character. And he's not, like he's a wise cracking, sure of himself like lead and it's just it works and i'm just like this would fit perfectly somewhere in the mcu or even the dc universe i just can't quite put my finger on the right character for him to him to take over i've always thought of him possibly being somewhat um like john stewart and we talked about it before and you said he john stewart the character of green lantern would probably be too limiting for his Talent. A little straight, John yeah. Stewart. The way I read it, a little straight. Yeah. Not, yeah. not, not, not as yeah. So. And then I started thinking about Blue Marvel. So that could. Yeah. That could. I although you wanted to bring it back to this, I I know it wouldn't happen because it's already been changed. I actually did think of Blade for at least two seconds, just because of the physical demands of the role, mm -hmm. but also because Blade has not quite the Deadpool personality but he has a little bit of that edge in his yeah. personality and i was like herschel is physically very imposing and looks yeah. great but does he have the the kind of that humorous kind of dark humor edge that he's gonna need and i'm like this guy has that i don't know it made me just wonder for two seconds if if he could have pulled if he might have been a slightly more interesting choice but yeah you know the concern not, who knows if that who knows because nothing's been done with blade it's just all talk right now but the concern I have with Mahershala Ali being Blade is that is he too easily compared to Wesley Snipes? Because in terms of look, if you if you ever saw Luke Cage, he reminded me of Wesley Snipes. Mm -hmm. And not to say that it was a bad thing. He just reminded me, and I think he did a great job, and most people would agree that he was great as Cottonmouth. But for Blade, Wesley Snipes is a bar that he has to, I believe, exceed. Because if he's he meets the same, there's going to be too many comparisons. And I don't know, you're going to have perhaps some polarizing thoughts as to who's better. But John David Jackson as Blade would be a different, it'll be dope. It would be dope if it was him. I just, I mean, Wesley Snipes had the benefit of, you know, martial arts experience and that really came in handy and you could see it. He was very comfortable. I mean, obviously he didn't do every single stunt, but he was very comfortable. They could choreograph advanced fight scenes with mm -hmm. him. And I watched this movie and I was like, some of the fight scenes in this movie are incredibly hard. I mean, you do, I mean, if you're, if you know the general idea, he's basically fighting forward and reverse in time effectively. And it's, incredibly difficult i'm not quite sure how they pulled all of it off but he's amazing at it and he uses random tools and all sort of stuff and you're just like yeah like this guy can do it like it's gonna be really interesting if you had a a mask and a uniform on and i just don't quite know exactly where he would fit but i hope i hope someone will get him involved in one of these at some point so so I, I wanted to end it off with um, any thoughts with Warner Brothers, but I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure you guys got the the gist of what what our take is on this article. I suggest you guys read it. It's very interesting, very detailed as to what is going on behind the scenes at AT and T and Warner Brothers. Um, WandaVision. I started watching it. And I was hoping for some more progress that led us away from what they were currently doing in the first two episodes. The third episode was a lot more the same. And the only time I really got interested when things started, usually when things aren't going well 
and things are not are off a little bit for Wanda is when I get interesting because of course that's uh, why we're here yeah yeah you said six last time this one has tried my patience I'm I'm ready to move on hopefully with the if you saw WandaVision the last scene the the, the aspect ratio changed from okay. it's uh, I don't know the aspect ratio number for that but it expanded to widescreen and how we normally used to seeing TV right now hopefully this is the change or, or the second the, the second act of this um nine part episode i mean um series yeah we, do we have official is it nine i believe like, it's nine okay i mean they're short you know that's the one thing that's been getting me through these is they're short yeah i mean i'm with you i actually found i mean so it was the Brady Bunch, right? So we started with Dick Van Dyke and Bewitched, and now we're doing Brady Bunch. I thought it was utterly unwatchable until the Ultron comment. Yes. Unwatchable. Like, until we got to that scene, I was like, if this wasn't what I know it's going to be, I would have given up a long time ago. Yeah, like, yeah. this is, these these gags are dumb, and I'm over them. Yeah, yeah. And now I've seen them for three episodes. So call it close to an hour of TV. Like I need something. Like I need, I need, I need her to her hands to start to turn red. And <laughs> I need him, I need his forehead to light up because this yeah. is, you know. But um, then, you know, you get that, you get the scene with um Monica. Well, I guess who were who was supposed who's gonna be Monica Rambo hasn't been named as such. Mm -hmm. And then her being blown through the screen into what I assume is the real world. I think yes. that's what we saw at the end. And it gives you that hope of like, okay, maybe finally we're going to move this story along, or at least in some parallel track where it's like, all right, maybe she's inside, but then we're seeing action outside, and that's gonna that's gonna bring us toward where we where we need to be. Yeah, so. it almost feels like you're forcing me to watch something I don't want to watch. That's what it feels like to me. It's like I want to see this through, but. I'm not enter I'm not entertained right now. It's like I'm watching something that somebody is forcing me to watch because of who they are and all that other stuff, you know? Yeah, I have to be honest. That's good. It goes back to a point I made last time. Like I, even within the sitcom motif, I'm a little surprised that they stayed so restrained on the comic book element of this. Like I would have thought even if we were gonna be in a black and white 1950s show there would have been more things like the beekeeper scene, more things like um, Agatha Harkness kind of warning the neighbor, don't give it away, more things like the Ultron comment. I think they could have done a lot more yeah. of that in the first three parts and yeah. still kept it inside this kind of nod to classic television. So yeah, I would say from a scripting and storytelling perspective the balance has felt off and i think they they owe us a little bit i feel like yeah. after these three <laughs> i'm hoping that if, if we get a fourth episode that's similar to this i mean again i'm gonna watch it but it's like i don't want to watch this but i'm gonna watch it <laughs> i assume we're going to be in the 80s right next yeah. time i mean we've done 50s 60s 70s True. So I'm assuming, like, I don't know if we're getting family ties or what, but like, I assume we're gonna get something, <laughs> something yeah. from the '80s. Yeah, I hope I hope we get something um, that picks up the pace a little bit into what's going on, and uh, I just I, I'm just over it a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's Wandavision. That's our take on Wandavision. Um, let's get to GVK. You know how people was talking BVS, GVK, Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> Listen, when I saw the poster and you see the city and you see how big these dudes are, you're like, how is anyone really gonna, they're like, there's gonna be total destruction. It's going to be crazy. And I'm going to say this again for people who didn't hear me the last time when I said this. Godzilla, the first one that came around, I forget what it was called. It Godzilla. Was, 
It was, it was called, Godzilla. called Godzilla. And then yeah. this, the next one was called uh, Godzilla. King of the Monsters. King of the Monsters. Mm -hmm. Those are the best Godzillas I've ever seen. To, for you to get me to watch the other Godzillas, you have to tie me down, put some duct tape on my eyelids. Those are unwatchable for me. But as a kid, fantastic. As a grown dude, no. But this is going to be crazy. I started thinking about, yo, how is King Kong really going to fight this dude? How is he going to beat him? I don't know if he can, but it's going to be interesting to see how they are able to pull that off. It can be some weak stuff. It got to be something very, I don't know. I don't. I just don't know how he beats Godzilla, but how excited are you? I mean, I, they also showed some pieces of like some footage, right? Like two yeah. second pieces. Were, yeah, we'll get the trailer uh, yeah. late, you know, Sunday. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, um, look, I, it was interesting to me when the second one you know, came out and like the review, you know, the reviews for the first one were quite good. And then the reviews for the second one were not that good. And I loved it. Well, but my point is like, do we really even need reviews for a movie <laughs> like this? Yeah, like, this like, ain't that hard, right? Yeah, like if you, yeah. you either, you either like this kind of movie or you don't. Oh, you don't. This exactly. is not, these movies aren't going to sell you that like, if you don't like monsters on screen, you know, in, in a, in a death match or in sort of, you know, then, then great. Like that's not for you. Yeah. But if you do, like, if you have any affinity for, you know, old monster movies or of that nature, which, you know, I do, I know you do, it's like, this is the, this is what we waited for our whole lives. It's like, this is what, you know, 1933 King Kong and Ray Harryhausen could only dream of from an effects perspective, you know? And so just to see those snippets of those two head to head, I was like, I take my money. Like, I don't yeah. care. Like, you know, I, I'm ready. Re this is the kind of movie also that I feel like I'm, I will be very happy when it's on TV to pop in for five to 10 minutes and be like, Oh, that fight's coming <laughs> up. I'll watch that for the 27th time. No problem. No problem. Hells yeah. Hells yeah. Um, I, I, I'm interested in this question. I mean, we're both ready to see King Kong versus God. So we're, we're going to see it. Um, does it come out in the theaters at the same time as uh, HBO Max? Yeah. So this is interesting. They moved this one up. Um, so this is one of the rare cases that they're moving this into the March or April timeframe. They want to get this to people faster, um, theaters okay. and streaming. So they're not waiting for the vaccine to bring people back. So it sounds like we're going to get this around the same time as the Snyder's cut. It's interesting also too. I saw, uh, the AMC, I was about to delete the app. I have the AMC app on my phone. And then I looked and I said, if we have 40% capacity, you could come still see, you know, movies and all that other stuff. It's, that's one that's interesting that, that if it's playing, I don't know if I would go see it in a theater. I'm interested in, I'm interested in seeing it, but I don't, I don't know if I'm like used to just seeing movies at home now. Would yeah, you go see it after, to... would you see yeah. it after? you see it on HBO Max. Yes, I would. So, yeah, I said this to you previously. I think like there's certain movies that if if we fast forward like a year from now and everything's okay and we can all go back to theaters, I, they could re-release some of these. Like I would go back. Like, mm -hmm. so Wonder Woman 84, off my list. Not good enough. Hell no. Tenant, 100% on my list. I would go to the, now that I especially have seen it and kind of understand it, like I would 100% go to the theater and experience it for the sound and the visuals. King Kong versus Godzilla, same thing. I'll be very happy to watch it at home. I actually think, you know, funnily, I actually think, I don't know if they could do this, but with the with the preponderance of drive-in theaters that have popped up around the country during the pandemic, I actually feel like this would be a great movie for a drive-in. You pop that in your car stereo, turn that up and like have a big screen. I would actually would rather do that if it was possible yeah, yeah. but i don't think it's going to be an option um, yeah. but i yeah if they want to re-release it a year from now i would absolutely go back but, but the thing is it. because they're so backed up what hard yeah. know, what time frame would you would you want or could you put it out could you put yeah. it out for a month i don't know so that's going to be interesting um can't be bad though like i, I like yeah. for what we want to get out of it this cannot be bad yeah like no um, let's get into some, uh, some rumors. I know we only have one today and this, what this rumor had me hyped because I am a huge fan of Batman, the animated series. It was one of the things that I used to look forward to when I got out of school. 
I used to rush Same. home. Agreed. Yeah. To watch Batman the animated series. It's fantastic. Damn, it was good. And then Justice League Unlimited and all that stuff. And then you hear the rumor that there's a possibility that they may release. I mean, there are two shows, but this one, there's a possibility of they may do a, 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 a Batman the Animated Series 2, I guess, or a continuation or just more shows uh, 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 of the same sort of uh, thing that they did last time. Yeah, I don't think we know exactly what this would be. I mean, I assume it would be a kind of almost like a remix, like obviously some of the classic, you couldn't do this without, I mean, I assume Mark Hamill would be the Joker again. I don't think yeah. they could do this without him. I mean, Kevin Conroy is still around yeah. as the voice of Batman, so you could clearly do that. He sounds yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, so I, I assume they would remix some of the same villains and then they could introduce some of the newer ones, you know, as well or update that. but. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the, the bar is very high here. So I, I would hope if they're going to this well, it is with a lot of the same people who created this originally, Bruce yeah. Timm and company, and that's, you can keep the spirit amazing. alive and the storytelling alive, because this was the gold standard for sort of this genre when it, when it, it changed the genre when it came yeah. out. Yeah, you know? definitely so. did. Um, and I hope it happens, though. I hope it happens. I this would be a happens. great use of streaming talent, I think, to do this. Yeah. I hope I hope it happens, too, but with the same people that, that brought us that, the same minds that brought us those stories on TV. Because if they do, uh, you know, it, it's sometimes tough to come back to something that you love the first time, and when they do it again, yeah, it's, no. and it's not the same, it's not the same feeling, it, it, it's it's not necessarily tough to watch, but it doesn't bring back that same awe that we had when we when we first saw it. But it's it for me it's it's this series and it's the X Men series. That's the, the one. The talking. one from the, that. Those are the two that like to me. If you were gonna try to bring that same spirit and same idea and do new episodes with that, those are the two series that I'd be yeah. most apt to watch. Did you ever watch um, the Netflix animated Japanese series of the X-Men? I've seen a little bit of it. Um, it's interesting though, for me, like I found that most newer incarnations of cartoons, I haven't been able to get as immersed in. I was actually, I was actually um, revisiting Transformers recently. Oh and, yeah, I can't get it. And the newer stuff is just not as good. G1 oh. is still the best. <laughs> that is still the best by far. Like I just, Man. you know. So Man. it shows you the danger of doing something like this. But yeah, I think with this, it's like if they get the get the talent back, get the writers and the creator back, like I'm all for it. I would definitely watch it. If you guys haven't watched um, that show, that animated show on Netflix of the X-Men, I think the guy that does Wolverine is dope, Professor hmm. X. Yeah, that's A fair. lot of the characters, um, they did him justice. You know, the stories are probably a little bit off. You know, it still reminds you of the Japanese animation, you know. Um, but still, I think the performances were really well done, and 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 those would be a consideration if they wanted to do a, a remix of, of what they did the, the did the first time. They can do with these guys um, um, that that did the voiceovers. They, they were dope. Um, so that is it for our show today. Thank you guys for coming back to listen to us, bringing you. The news. Hope you guys read that article. Hope you guys check out that X Men show. It's really dope. Hope you guys check out Lupin. I don't know if you have if you've checked it. I out. haven't had a chance to watch it yet. It's on my list though. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. It's really, it's really, really, really good. Um, Brian, anything? Um, any last words? No. Like I said, I think I'm I'm fascinated with the Chris Nolan saga. That's my biggest thing. And it'll take a while, I think, to shake out. But I just, I can't wait to find out where he goes and, and what that means for the kind of movies that he puts out. And then, like you said, I think we've vented our frustrations with WandaVision. So hopefully we're on the cusp of getting to getting to the meat on the bone here. Because I think yeah. it's three episodes have been enough. Enough of this, uh, enough of this dancing around the old, uh, the old comedies. Yeah, I agree with you, man. Thank you once again. Please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Comment in the comment section below. Share it with your friends, people who like this genre but don't know what's going on. Get their quick fixes with um, other YouTubers who give you what's going on, but they don't really go into it like we do, I think. 
Um, so def- I always enjoy these discussions, and I hope you guys too. Um, and thank you for joining us. Joining us, and um, have a good night, have a good day, and good morning. <laughs>